It's not going to take you long to figure out that this little video or series of videos is totally unrelated to this space that I'm sitting in. This is where I record industrial automation videos. But today we're going to talk about an N-scale model train layout. And I distinguish between toy trains and model trains because uh, these scale models are literally that. They are scale models. They're not toy trains. The locomotives cost between two and four hundred dollars a piece, and in the hands of a kid, they'd be destroyed in a matter of minutes, at a minimum. So this this little uh, layout, uh, I've been working on it on and off for a while, and I decided that I would do a little video on it. It is an N scale folded dog bone. It's a particular popular layout that. Uh, probably has too much track per square foot. There should be some acceptable ratio of how many feet of track you have or how many inches of track you have per square foot of your layout. Because you hit a certain point and that's all you got is track and a little bit of space in between the track and you don't have anything left to make it look like real world because we know other than a switch yard or a staging yard, uh, you might have one or two tracks going by and everything else is the terrain and buildings. However, this just is on the edge of too much track per square foot of layout. So let's start looking at this. End scale folded dog bone, Red Rock Railroading. This is a fairly common uh, layout. Only part of this is in process right now, and that is the part that is on the left hand of the screen. What you're seeing is the folded dog bone, but then over to the right, you're seeing a two-level reversing loop. And this will be added later. The dual reversing loops, they're stacked. In other words, one of them's two inches higher than the other, two and a half inches that involves a couple pairs of turnouts. The trick is to position them so you don't have a lot of track covered up to make it easy to you know, work with trains that derail. So that's the goal is to add this to the existing layout. And this is kind of what that uh, looks like. So I'm using AnyRail 6 software, which allows me to do a 3D presentation or a 3D view of my layout. So this is not exactly what it would look like because I've already shifted the two uh, dual track uh, reversing loops as shown here. Some of these uh, locations around so the upper track doesn't cover up that much of the lower track. Otherwise I lose access to the, you know, to get trains back on the track that might derail. So this is the area that we're primarily concerned with, and this is the folded dog bone. Now there's one modification, and you can see right in the middle, or from bottom left to upper right, the magenta and the green, I have a train station siding, if you want to call it that, and then a main trunk in green going on by the station. So that's really the only modification. Unfortunately, this did result in too many bridges. So you could call this layout one bridge too many, if you like. And I'll show you the one other mistake that I made when it came to elevation and how close tracks are to each other. So now let's look at the 3D view of the whole layout. And you can see from the reversing loops, this is the older image of the reversing loops. It only shows a single track for each reversing loop. The area where I really made a mistake is on the uh, right side where the upper elevation swings around close to a double track down below. You can see that dark shaded area uh, that's really just a little too close to make it look realistic. But I have to live with it. It's too far gone now to change it.
And this is uh, the basic, if you want to call it platform or table, inexpensive, just under quarter inch plywood with one by threes uh, to stiffen it up a little bit. Glued and screwed. Now you can remove the screws once the glue's set because it's not coming apart if you glue it well. But you may want to remove the screws because later on you may want to attach something. The screws are no longer visible, but you go to run a nail or something else down in to the platform and you run into the head of a screw. Not a bad idea to remove the screws at this point. This is the top and you see I started to sketch with a homemade compass the layout on there and then I got to thinking about you know what this is this isn't going to work out real well. I mean you can do it this way. A better idea is I used any rail 6 and I just increased the ratio of the print and I printed out the layout full size. So you can see here I've taken it looks like 7 8 and a half by 11 portions of the printout from any rail six and I lined up the little targets. If you look in the corner of each sheet, you'll see little concentric circles. Those are targets. So you can line up the sheets and tape them together. So you see I've completed now one length of the layout. Then I uh, completed the rest of them. So you see it's four by seven, eight and a half by 11 sheets. And I laid it out on the tabletop, the platform and kind of taped it down in place. So this gives me a method to transfer my pattern. Now I'm not going to stick to this pattern, but it does get me started. I also sat, although I don't end up using this bridge, I end up using a different bridge with a full size layout, you know, printed out, laying on your platform, you can set some components on there and check them out to see kind of what they're going to look like. And here I sat a Cotto Silver Streak locomotive with a couple passenger cars and I set it on a curve. This is one of the tighter radiuses of the folded dog bone. I just wanted to see how ridiculous it's going to look going around the corners. First thing I did to actually work on the layout was I cut out the river space. Now you can't tell by looking at it, but the notch on the bottom one by three is not the same depth as the one on the upper side. I actually cut one of them deeper than the other to create an illusion of the direction that the water would flow. Then I took and attached a piece of that same plywood underneath of the River. So at this point, I have a river bottom and I have the uh, shape of the sides. Then I realized that I needed a little more height for the rail, the double track on this side of the board. So I took a strip of that inexpensive, just under quarter inch plywood. And in order to kind of reduce the weight, instead of making a half inch spacer, I just used one strip and then I used some small uh, pieces glued on there so I could get a little more height. Now you see I've applied it. So I'm building up the height now of that section of track that's going to go across the river. Now what I did was I took a piece of foam board. These, um, the markings on this foam board are really irrelevant. Okay. But I had already started to transfer a pattern onto the foam board when I changed my mind and went to the full printout with the eight and a half by 11 sheets. But I used that piece of foam and cut it out half inch foam. Then I took scissors and cut out that part of the layout from the full size printout and laid it on top there so I could continue. And then I cut out another section of it so I could add some height. So I cut out that foam and then I cut out that section of the full printout and laid it down inside. That one piece that I cut out is now back down at the top of the plywood level and the rest of it is a half inch up based on the spacer and the foam. And I also cut out the river from the full scale layout and laid it in the bottom of the river and then laid the rest of the layout 
on the other half. But you can see it gives you kind of an idea of what it's going to look like. Now at this point, it's not too late to turn around and do something different. But so far, I still like it. So I continued. I've, I'm looking at it from a different angle now. Cutaway that's down at the board level and then the half inch foam spacer. I'm raising the uh, little mobile home park. That's the brown patch with the three rectangles on it. This is all going to be a 1950s, let's say 19, late 40s to early 60s. Everything is going to be older than early 1960s. Originally, I wanted to do 1950s, but there was a particular locomotive that I really liked, the paint pattern, and I couldn't come up with anything suitable to stay in the 1950s. So I will bump the time era up whenever I bring that particular locomotive out onto this layout. But the the houses or the buildings I'm going to use uh, could be late 30s and 1940s. It's the automobiles and the locomotives that are going to cause a time shift on this layout. And you see that I now have the bridges that I'm going to use. So I have a, uh, a dual bridge there. And I saw something like this in Arizona, kind of southwest of Buckeye. Can't remember the reservoir, but there is a bridge, a series of these bridges stretching across better than an eighth of a mile wide, kind of a dry arroyo in the desert in Arizona. Quite impressive to look at, but I've only got two of them going on here. Then I've got this other bridge. I'm starting to kind of visualize how it's going to look because I want drama. Model railroads I think, you know, there's two basic, I'm sure there's more than that. I'm oversimplifying it, but basically you got people that like to do ops or operations. In other words, they want to run a railroad and they want to drop off cars, pick up cars and move tankers, freight cars, flatbeds around. I'm kind of strictly a passenger car passenger train kind of person and my end goal this will be totally automated with routes and a schedule and I will just turn on the system and set with a Moscow mule or a mojito or a martini or some other nonsense and sit and watch and listen to it because all of the uh, skill model locomotives are going to be DCC with sound. So I'm looking for drama. So I need some altitude and attitude. At this point, I had not realized I had one bridge too many, but I had to get across the river with a regular road for automobiles and trucks. So I ended up with just one too many bridges, but I got to live with it. Okay, now you see that I've started to add the foam grade. Woodland Scenics, uh, flexible grade foam components. And you can see that it, uh, I've got one on this side. And I think that that grade is just a little more than what, I think it might be 3%. I can't remember, but uh, my locomotives are not having any tr trouble negotiating that grade. But it would have been better to stick to less grade. But then my bridge would not have been as dramatic. Remember, I'm after drama. I want a lot of what they call reveal. I want the locomotives and their consist or their train to reveal themselves from behind or underneath something or out of something. So I want a lot of character and reveal on this layout. This is a small layout, not necessarily so small for an end scale, because remember that if this were HO, it would take four times the surface area because HO is basically twice as tall, twice as wide, twice as long. That's actually a factor of eight. So this exact same layout would take eight times the volume or four times the two-dimensional uh, width and length, which means if this thing were six foot by 12 and a half, 13 foot, like an HO, you might have trouble reaching to the middle of the lay layout to do work on it. So that's one place that you see a lot of folded, folded dog bones is with end scale. So you see I'm progressing here and I have, you know, jumped a little bit in time and you notice I'm using foam to 
and I keep stacking up layers of half inch foam to build up the altitude or the elevation on the flat surfaces and then I use the Woodland Scenics grade foam products to get me my grade for my track. But you can see I'm still using my full size pattern to kind of keep track of what I'm doing. And this is a view from what's going to be covered up. So this end is going to be completely covered up, but I have an opening on this end so I can reach in and deal with any uh, delinquent trains that jumped off the track and need to be put back on. And there's a variety of, way, a variety of ways that the trains can get derailed aside from just poor track installation, especially when you can't see what you're doing. You can see at this point the uh, automotive truck bridge going across the river. Okay, now th uh, this is a better view of that bridge. And you can see that I had to build up the front edge of this layout to get the dual track, the double track going across the front of the layout at the exact height that I wanted. And at this point, I don't have anything fixed in the river. So you can see that I've I maintain my proper grade going across the river with that uh, foam sections. I actually laid it across, glued it down, and then cut out the section across the river. The bridge, notice that I do have the abutments and the pillars adjusted so one of them's down in the river and the other's up on land. Also, that's a little bit more drama. Now, at this point, the work got a little messy, and that is I wanted to pour the river banks, and I wanted a strata that looked fairly realistic. So what I did, and I've never done any of this before, so I built a dam in between the bottom of the river and the plywood platform. You can't see it as basically cardboard, and that keeps my pour for the river bank from going underneath and leaking out the bottom of the layout. So I have a dam on the outside of the river, then on the inside of the river, I just use uh, scraps of foam and pin them to the plywood and then tape them where I needed to and then took an X-Acto and carved out the shape that I wanted. And so what I did was I took plaster, a mixture, and I tinted it with paint, with acrylic paints. I probably could have used something smarter but hey, I'm brand new to this. You can see I poured a gray and then I poured an, kind of an orange and a red. Those aren't the names of the colors. They're uh, umber and I'm drawing a blank <laughs> on the, these colors. So you can see what I did was I poured them in layers. You don't have to make both sides match because most strata is not level with gravity, meaning that there's usually some slope to the strata, so one side of the river could be a little higher than the other. But one thing I did do is, on each side of the river, I poured them level. In other words, I poured enough in there and then moved it around with a spatula to make sure it was level. So at this point, I could start carving on those banks. Now, I'm not recommending this method to everyone. Uh, what I wanted is a deep-looking, kind of a gorge river look with the uh, southwest rock colors and some strata. And I will tell you something about plaster. Uh, you want to carve on it before it gets real hard. Okay, now you see I've got both sides of the river done. And I'm kind of setting up my uh, dual uh, truss bridge over there and the pillar underneath of it. And I'm getting ready to form uh, the, I guess you could say the sandbar that the pillar is going to look like it's setting on. It's really not. The pillar would go deep into the river and then the sandbar would form around it, you know, just because of interference of the flow. You just take a second and look it over and you can see that I maintain the grade and that one uh, kind of complex looking arrangement over there on the far end that's a switchback going from the where the station is going to be down below uh, and it's a switchback that goes up to the upper level and originally I was going to have it go across the track on the far end there uh, the lower far end and then go out through a tunnel as if it's going through a mountain you know a highway and on it turns out I did something different but you can see at this point I'm starting to lose the full size layout. The main reason for it was to see how it was going to look and to get the foam 
uh, flexible foam grade sections down in the right place so the track would lay nice. Now I'm building up a removable section so I can lift it off to get to trains underneath there. And there's nothing special about this. I just used a piece of plywood. I cut it out to match the shape and I started adding little vertical pieces so I could have another layer to give a little bit more altitude or elevation. And there's the next elevation up. So you can see there's ample space to reach in there and deal with any delinquent trains that have tried to get off the track. Uh, on the left end, the, I actually have pins into the bottom part of the platform. So when I set the removable section down, it's setting down into openings for the pins so it always sets in the exact same position. So I have pin guides on both ends. As it turns out, I'm going to abandon some of this anyway, but I went through the process of doing it so I thought I would show it. Okay, now I'm laying cork. Okay, so now it's starting to look like there might be some track involved. So I went through and laid all the cork. I've never done any of this before. So it wasn't done perfect, but you can see it's taking shape. Okay, the next thing I did, and notice at this point I've carved up the riverbank a little bit. It's not completely finished, but uh, you can see that it has kind of a, a chiseled by freeze-thaw cycle look to it. It's not perfect. And you can see the different colors, and they are, they're more believable than if you just made one pour and then tried to paint it. And of course you can't carve it after you paint it if you're painting instead of tinting it. Remember this plaster had acrylic paint in it so I can carve on this and it doesn't lose the color. I painted the bottom of the river this uh, dark kind of forest green and you can see my little sandbar Actually, it doesn't, it's not very realistic, and even though I paint it later to make it look like concrete, I wish, I wish that I had done something different. I'll explain to it when we see more of it. Now, this is two shots, and I poured this acrylic river in th at least three, maybe four pours. So what I did was I raised one side of the layout so one end of the pour would be deeper than the other just again to give the appearance of a direction of water flow. So I poured one level, put the rocks in first. So all those rocks, they might be too big, too small, I don't know, I'm learning at this. I put the rocks in, glued them down to that green bottom, and then I took very carefully and different, some different colors of green and greenish paint and dabbed in some water plants downstream from the rocks because if you've ever stood and looked down a river like this and it's got any flow at all you can see water plants behind the rocks moving now the the dots are really too big okay but once it was painted it was painted i wasn't about to go back and tear it all out and do it over again i did this in multiple pours though i poured one level of acrylic then i dabbed on some water plant poured another level and dabbed on some more Hopefully, when it's done, it'll, there'll be some depth to it. In other words, you can see that some of the river plants are at a lower depth than others. It creates an illusion of depth. Then I try to add ripple with uh, decoupage or whatever that stuff is that the ladies like to use when they do... Oh, I can't even remember what they call them. They put a, cut out a bunch of pictures and put them all on a flat surface decoupage or whatever it is. And you can see when it's not set there it's white and actually a little of that wouldn't be bad because it looks like uh white water but that's not what i was after i was just after kind of a gentle ripple so when it's set and you can see there it's not completely set because you still see some white spots i didn't like it eventually i was picking at it and realized i could just peel the whole thing off and that's what i did i peeled all that ripple back off and i've yet to redo it Okay, so from cork, I went to track. So now I've got some track laid. Remember, this is DCC, occupancy detection. I have probably 20 or so isolated electrical zones in this track. 
the smaller the layout you have, the smaller those zones tend to get. So if this were a good sized layout, each zone or section would have more length to it. The nice thing about having too many zones is you can always combine them. But if you don't have enough, adding them later is a real pain. Now I've got the track laid and the river is not complete, but it's, it's getting there. It's poured though, because I won't pour any more river at this point now that I've got all those bridges in there. Okay, and that's that one spot I told you about where when I'm looking straight down at the plan view, the track didn't look too close to the other section of track. But then when you raise it up two or three inches, you realize you got a wall now that's just not really that realistic. I'm gonna squeeze by, but I wished I'd have made the layout at least two or three inches wider, deeper, however you wanna call it, so I had more space right there. It would have been an easy thing to do. As a matter of fact, it, there would have been a lot of benefit to it. So these are things to consider too many bridges, too much track, and if you're going to have elevation, you need some space between the track. Then I started wiring it up, because remember I told you I had a whole bunch of zones. Now at this point, I was using some Kato turnouts and some Peco turnouts. You can see the Peco motors poking down from up above. I end up abandoning most of the Pecos uh, for good logical reasons, and the Kato's work really good. The reason I didn't originally use all Kados, I thought if I had to tear out a turnout, it would be much more destructive to the layout. Now I've realized that the Pecos, if I have to pull out turnouts, there's just a lot more to deal with with the Peco turnouts, but they are really nice. I also put switches on the bottom of the Peco motors so I could get feedback on the position that the turnouts were in. As it turns out, the motors didn't seem powerful enough to switch the turnout and the switches down below. So I ended up removing all the switches. Now I use the hobby type terminal blocks, terminal strips. I'm an industrial controls engineer, so normally I use industrial terminal blocks. You can't see the connection. Okay, it goes in an opening and then you screw the clamp down on it. I prefer this type because I can more clearly see where my conductors are at. And these things are dirt cheap. And if you're going to install terminal strips like this, use, use the long ones. If you got a bunch of extra ones hanging off the end, big deal. You know, they're there to be used. But if you use the smaller ones that you have just enough terminals, you'll run out of terminals, I'll guarantee you. At this point, I've got some electrical done. Uh, you can see that I used some cable. You can see the black sheathed cable with multicolor, and I use multicolor wire everywhere. The idea being when it comes out the other end, that I, I can identify the purpose by the color. There's only so many colors available. Uh, you want, don't want to get too convoluted with your wire colors, but you want to keep your wiring organized for sure. And you can see I've added a little bit more now. So I have all these wires coming out one end, and then I have uh, terminal strips running the entire length on this end. Now, eventually, that will go to a DigiKeys DR5000 occup occupancy detection, etc. You don't think there's a lot of wire involved until you actually start connecting them up. Remember, I have a whole bunch of occupancy detection zones that are going to run to a DigiKeys system. Probably more than I need, but I'd rather have too many than not enough. You can see now that I'm starting to add some structure, and this rock formation was not in the original plans, but that end over there, it just didn't look right, because if you're coming into a river valley, then you've got a slope on both sides. So I decided to add this back in the corner and uh, it became a bit of a challenge, but it's actually working out really well. You'll see in later videos. That higher altitude there or elevation with the little cardboard rectangles on it and some little wood rectangles, that's the trailer park. I was gonna have a little town on the intermediate level there than having a road coming up turn into the town and then go up a little higher to the trailer park. So the trailer park and the town had a river view, so to speak. Again, I'm after drama. 
This is like a vacation when I was a kid in Arizona fantasy with trains. When I grew up, my folks, we drove from Michigan, Illinois, wherever, out to Arizona and drove through Red Rock Country, saw trains, rivers, creeks, you name it. I was trying to recreate that 1950s in my early teens, you know, drama. And by the way, those plywood pieces, uh, the concept there, and I ended up abandoning those, but it's not a bad idea. That way I could put the buildings and build up the, if you want to call it the cityscape on these, in the trailer park, on these boards, and then just set them in there and then trim them so they blended in well. The switchback road, it looks a little crude, but it would have worked out okay. I ended up abandoning it for something else, and you'll see that in a later video. But you can see that that's that flexible foam grade from Woodland Scenics, and I was going to have a motel on the upper level there in between the reverse, the reverse loop for the dog bone and the outside edge. Now remember that the two tracks on the upper right, those are underneath the mountain. You can't see those. Those are inside the tunnel. So we're gonna leave it right there. And in the next recording, I'll continue with what I'm doing. I, I apologize that it got up to 40 minutes. Probably should break it up into two, but if you find it of interest, just stop, come back to it later, and watch the rest of it. Thank you for watching.